Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, good afternoon. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Vincent Ingham. I'm working at EFAMA, the, the European Trade Association representing uh, the assets and fund management industry in Europe, based in Brussels. I'm very pleased to be in Malta today, in this uh, small but uh, dynamic and vibrant country, and to welcome you to this panel discussion uh, on the challenges of the ETFs to the asset management industry. Um, during the next 75 minutes, we would like to discuss, to discuss with you um, a relatively recent phenomenon in the asset management world called exchange-traded funds. And uh, we will analyze in particular the factors that have contributed to the, the success of these products and see how this could uh, potentially have an impact also <laughs> on the business model of other types of more traditional investment products. Um, we will also highlight some of the concerns that ETFs have raised with regulators and discuss how these concerns have been addressed or should be addressed in the future to maintain a high level of investor protection and also to maintain the trust investors have placed in these products. And last but not least, we will also discuss the opportunities that ETFs might rep right represent here in Malta to the Maltese funds industry. And of course, we as we very much want to have an interactive discussion with you, there will be time for a question and answer session where, we could have, where you will be, have the possibility to ask questions directly to, to the panelists. But without further ado, I would like now to introduce you to the, the three distinguished panelists who will bring uh, you their, their expertise and insights uh, on these different subjects. So on my uh, immediate left is Jonathan Bird. Jonathan is a corporate partner at the famous uh, law firm Freshfield Brookhouse Dringer uh, London office. Um, and he specializes in investment funds and asset management related matters. To his left is Aldo Scardino. Aldo is uh, currently head of the wealth management division at Bank of Valletta. And he has um, specific expertise uh, in uh, many areas of the financial sector, including in particular stockbroking, investment banking, institutional investment management, and also treasury management. And to the far left is uh, Joe Portelli. And Joe is currently managing director and chief investment officer at FMG Funds, uh, an investment fund company specializing in the emerging markets. No. Before moving to the, to the heart of the debate, we thought it would be useful perhaps for those of you in the, in the room who are less familiar with ETF to share with you a few figures to give you a sense of the, the rapid growth of the ETF markets, but also uh, of the relative importance of these products compared to the uh, global asset management universe. <laughs> And so I have prepared a, a couple of slides through which I would like to, to take you very quickly. I'm sorry if I'm standing up in, in the middle of the, the game. I hope you, you all are able to see the slides. So these first slides uh, shows the, the evolution of the global UCITS uh, market, both in terms of assets under management and in terms of number of products over the last decade. In terms of AUM, uh, what you can see is that there's a, a still a significant growth over the last decade, as you see it um, stood 88% higher at the end of 20, uh, 2012 uh, than they were uh, 10 years before. But it is also equally clear that you see it suffered heavily from the 2007 financial crisis with a sharp decline that you can see in the assets under management in 2008. And it's only very recently that these assets under management have recovered their pre-crisis level. Now, in terms of number of products, uh, the figures remain relatively stable since 2005, uh, with even a slight decrease in number of products since 2008, probably partly due to the fact that many uh, asset management companies were forced to uh, rationalize their fund ranges. In contrast to the global evolution of the UCITS industry, 
uh, European ETFs, as you can see on, on, on this slide, enjoyed a very robust uh, growth over the same period uh, in terms of AUM and even uh, more in terms of creation of new products. Um, and what I think is, is quite remarkable in this slide and to what I, I wanted to, to draw your attention more specifically is the fact that even during the 2007-2008 financial crisis, uh, ETFs continue to grow and new products were created at a steady pace. So, of course, you could say that uh, starting from zero, uh, remember that the uh, first uh, ETFs were listed in Europe only in 2000, it's quite easy uh, to, to grow rapidly, but still I believe it's, it's not exaggerated to talk about a success story for these, for these, times of, uh, these types of products. Next slide shows you uh, the market share of ETFs relative to the global usage market. And there you clearly see that ETF, despite their um, impressive growth, still represent a relatively small fraction of the usage world in general. Um, at the end of 2008, uh, it, uh, 11 sorry, ETFs only represented roughly 7% of the entire usage universe. Uh, and so I think this helps, uh, and, and these figures you can see uh, remained uh, relatively stable over the last five years, again, despite this, this uh, impressive growth in, in, in the size of the ETF market. So I think this also helps to put the, the, the growth of the ETF market into perspective. And the last figures uh, and the last slide I wanted to, to, to share with you um, illustrates the concentration of the ETF market on a small number of uh, ETF providers. Um, on this slide you see the, the, the top 10 uh, uh, ETF providers in Europe and you see that the three most important providers uh, represent roughly 70% of the market share and uh, that the nine biggest provi providers hold more than 90% of market share. So it's a very concentrated market and this tendency is likely to uh, continue in the future, not notably with the recent announcement by uh, iShares of their intention to uh, acquire the, the ETF business of Credit Suisse. So these are uh, a number of figures I thought would be useful to share with you. So basically, impressive growth, but still a relative fraction of the usage industry and definitely a very concentrated market. Now it's time for me to turn to to the panel and I would like to start maybe uh, with a question for you, Aldo, and maybe a, a very basic question. Uh, what is exactly an exchange traded fund? What, how would you define it? What are its main features? And what makes it different from other type of investment products and maybe also from other types of exchange traded products? Yes, uh, thank you, Vincent. Uh, perhaps we should rather speak about exchange traded products rather mm -hmm. than exchange traded funds because only a part of these instruments are really funds. Um, let's start with the most basic. The, the ETF, which are the funds, and we can divide them into two basic categories. One of them is the fully replicated fund. So basically, you have a fund manager which buys underlying securities, and it's tracking um, that index. So for the FTSE 100, for example, the fund manager would buy the the constituents of the FTSE 100 in the same weighting and uh, would, track, would track that, that index. Now there we talk about tracking errors. So how, how close does that fund, does that ETF um, uh, move in line with the, with the underlying index? But there are regulatory aspects as well. Who is keeping those constituents, those, uh, those assets for the ETF? And from uh, an institutional perspective, we should rather speak about tracking difference and not tracking error. And where does that difference come? Where does that outperformance come? Because the ETF does securities lending. It lends those assets to get income and outperform the index. But securities lending brings up, along with it a lot of, a lot of um, risks as well. That is, that is the replicating, the fully replicating um, uh, uh, model. Then you have the optimization model. If you're tracking the um, MSC 500 index, for example, you cannot possibly own all the constituent assets, so you optimize. You buy the major assets 
so that you track as much as possible. And again, there you have the tracking difference uh, question from an institutional perspective. Because if you don't own all the underlying constituents, you're gonna have a difference in the, in the, in the performance. Um, the, the risks start to kick in when you don't own the securities directly um, and you do a derivatives-based ETF. So you try and replicate the performance of the underlying index without owning the constituents of that index. And that is normally done by the ETF entering into a total return swap with a swap counterparty. So basically what you're doing is you're going to a bank and you're swapping out the performance of the index. The, the bank is promising you the return, the performance of the index, okay? And you, and you as an ETF pay a variable rate based on a different index, which does not necessarily have the same assets as the benchmark that you're trying to track. And you go into these different risks then. You enter into counterparty risk. The owner of the ETF, the shareholder, all right, is incurring counterparty risk, which the ETF has, has um, contracted. When we talked about securities lending, that income is reflected in the performance in, of the ETF. You have to analyze whether all that income is going into the performance. That's a different thing. But when you encounter um, counterparty risk, it's not reflected in the shareholder's return. Okay, so it's incurring risk without getting rewarded for it. Then there is the further um, complication where you have ETFs which are doing a synthetic operation, okay, on an unfunded basis. So there isn't, there isn't a portfolio of securities which is different from the benchmark that it's trying to replicate. It's unfunded, okay? And that brings out even more, more risk because you have a counterparty risk with someone that is promising you a return which is trying to equate to the to the benchmark, but it doesn't, there isn't even collateral against that counterparty risk. And that's, that's the ETF's side. Then there are the notes, okay? You have uh, instruments which are termed ETF, but they're not funds, they're notes. They're trying to replicate the performance of gold, for example. But what is the risk for you? It's the, it's the risk, the counterparty of the fund manager. He's promising you a return which is linked to the performance of gold, for example, okay? But there is no underlying gold, okay? So your risk is that that fund manager does not deliver that performance to you. So those are the commodity uh, funds and there is the note funds. B but basically here we're talking about credit risk. So th my point is these are not even funds. They're outside the scope of the funds directive. These are notes, these are credit exposures. Okay, so the, the, calling them an ETF is a misnomer. Then you have the third, uh, the third uh, category, which is a catch-all, basically, and these are exchange-traded instruments, which are futures, options. They are neither notes there's, and they're neither funds. They are basically structured products. Um, but, however, there is a little bit of confusion in the market because we term all of these ETFs when, in reality, it's only the first part, which are really funds, and the rest are actually not funds. <clears throat> yes, I think, thank you, Aldo. I think this is an, uh, indeed a very important point you, you're making there and one that was also uh, underlined by regulators, the fact that in practice very often investors confuse ETFs with other types of ETP products, uh, exchange traded products, and that's therefore one of the reasons why ESMA was so keen in insisting on uh, giving a specific label to uh, ETFs to allow investors to better distinguish them from other types of products. If, if you want exposure to cattle because you think meat prices are going higher, okay, 20 years ago you had to open up an account with a futures broker, you had to send over margin, okay, then you had to place a trade. Guess what, if you want exposure to gold, if you want exposure to silver, how do you like exposure to India? How do you like exposure to Russia? How do you like exposure to Kazakhstan? With the ETFs, you can get very efficient exposure to a lot of very, very fascinating investments. If someone writes a book about the history of the financial markets and how it's evolved over the last 100 years, someone's gonna have to say that ETFs was a revolution. It brought the financial markets both to the individual investor and to the institutional investor.
Now, as an institutional portfolio manager, let me say this. Uh, I work for FMG. We are a $200 million uh, emerging market uh, fund. By the way, I bet someone earlier how many times I'm going to mention FMG today, okay? So I'm going to try to mention it's cheap uh, advertising with them. But we live with, um, with these ETFs. Uh, in some respects, we find them to be competition. But in a lot of respects, they keep us honest. I mean, I'll give you an example. We have a China fund, we have an India fund, we have a Russia fund. And the fact of the matter is we have to compete with the MSCI Russia ETF, with the MSCI China ETF, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not always easy competing. You know why? Because ETFs are cheap. ETFs are transparent. Uh, you can get ETF uh, execution pretty quickly. So from that perspective, it's it's competition, but it also keeps us honest and it also keeps us competitive. Not to mention the fact that we also utilize ETFs to generate alpha for our portfolios. We have three portfolios which trade ETFs exclusively. We use ETFs to, um, to trade tactically, to trade strategically, to market rotate from one country to the other. And I'll tell you this, they are absolutely indispensable to what we're doing. Now, let me give you an example. You know, there's a competitor out there actually um, I don't know if they're a competitor. I don't think they view us as a competitor, but there's a company out there called BlackRock. Okay, BlackRock is pretty big. They manage somewhere in the vicinity of $1 trillion. We manage somewhere in the vicinity of $200 million. They've got a fund called the, global, uh, the BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. This fund has somewhere in the vicinity of $50 billion. This fund alone employs roughly 55 investment professionals. FMG, we have roughly four investment professionals. We are managing a fund called the FMG Global Allocation Fund. What BlackRock does is they take the Global Allocation Fund from a bottom-up perspective. They have very, very smart investment managers, very smart analysts that are looking at Market and that are picking individual securities. We don't have the man hour, nor do we have the expertise to do that. What we're good at is picking ETFs. Our global allocation fund has roughly exposure to 24 ETFs. And what we've managed to do within this 24 ETFs is mimic a portfolio which in many respects is just as good as BlackRock's portfolio. And the only reason why we can do that is because we're top-down money managers and we're using ETFs. So from our perspective, ETFs are absolutely indispensable. Um, I see a bunch of people here that I know and, and I see a good friend of mine who's the head of the banking finance department um, at the university. And we have this discussion all the time. You know, we have to teach people who are learning how to invest and people who are studying investing. That sometimes the proper way to invest isn't by picking the needle in the haystack, but it's by investing in the haystack. And for example, there's been a lot of research which confirms that 90 to 95% of a portfolio's returns doesn't come from idiosyncratic um, issues, it comes from asset classes. So ETFs give us an efficient, affordable opportunity to invest in different asset classes, and we find it absolutely indispensable. I would like to move on in the debate and maybe ask you um, what you think are those uh, are the, the key factors in the success of these products, what make them so, so successful to and attractive to investors, and uh, maybe um, again... Uh, Definitely. Definitely, as Joe has mentioned, it's the ease of access to markets, um, uh, the relatively um, cheap way of uh, uh, investing and moving in and out of, of markets. And uh, obviously, it affects um, uh, normal funds because um, you can buy these as a normal share. You don't need to put in a redemption and wait uh, the number of days prescribed in a prospectus to wait for the money to come. So, as Joe was mentioning, this is quick, easy, and uh, efficient way of investing and getting exposure to markets, which um, markets and asset classes, which normally or uh, historically were difficult to to obtain. Okay, Jonathan, is, this, is there anything you would like to add at this stage? On you're asking the wrong man. I get paid to be a professional pessimist. So I think, I think unfortunately, I can tell you about the regulatory concerns and problems. Um, and I'll, I'll probably take a good beating from my two colleagues on my, uh, on my, on my left-hand side. Um, 
For, from my perspective, uh, looking at this from, from sort of legal framework, I think a couple of the comments that my other panelists have made earlier are very helpful. One is, when people talk about ETFs, they talk about all kinds of different things. And another point that um, I think from a, from a lawyer's perspective is, 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 is important is, um, ETFs really were born in the United States. Um, a lot of the investment opportunities, even for Europeans, are from US products. Um, the European market is sort of subtly different, uh, certainly from a regulatory perspective, and, 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 and has given rise to a number of uh, fairly interesting points, which I think are the sort of counterpoint to some of the, some of the comments made earlier. Um, the first thing I would say, though, is if you really want to get a regulator excited about something, give it a three-letter acronym. You know, calling something an ETF, you're going to get your regulators completely uh, excited about what's going on. And, and Joe, forgive me for saying this, you made a very sort of evangelical speech about ETFs. Um, I have heard other people say something similar about five or six years ago with another three-letter name, which was CDO. Um, and I think, I think <laughs> the, the, what, 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 what underpins about what I'm about to say, I think, is, is, is perhaps, for those of you who have a more sort of regulatory bent in the room, is an illustration of where regulators are these days and what the risks are of particular products. And I think what we've seen, and, and Vincent, you, you, you at a farmer have followed this very closely, is um, once the initial shock of the uh, financial crisis died down and regulators had worked out what a CLO was or a CDO was, or at least had worked out it had a three-letter acronym and it was incredibly complicated and the people who constructed it didn't really know how it would respond in stressed conditions. Uh, the regulators did think somewhat uh, that they didn't want to be caught asleep at the wheel again. And so, as Vincent's slides illustrated in the beginning, uh, we had a situation where we had a product that seems to, be, seems to withstand the crisis, a product that was growing even in 2007, 2008. Um, and regulators suddenly sort of woke up to the idea that, oh my goodness, is this our next three-letter acronym, systemic risk? What, what's going on? Uh, and, and, and some of the sort of points that the regulators have grappled with, and I think we as lawyers have grappled with, have been similar to the sort of securitization points. Uh, and they do um, really revolve around two areas. One is essentially mis-selling and misdescription. The other is in stress conditions, does the... Uh, you know, does the product actually do what it says on the tin? Can you rely on it? And, and, and what's interesting there is from a US perspective, uh, the US Securities Exchange Commission has been very active, essentially, in, in policing the US um, uh, ETF market. Um, there are all kinds of weird distinctions as a matter of law that have underpin some of the distinctions that Aldo has made about the differences in products that aren't necessarily apparent as an investor or a user of ETFs, but from a sort of structure and a manufacturer of ETFs kind of become quite interesting. And, and, and there have been certain things, certainly on the sort of commodity side as well, where the SEC has been quite slow uh, to allow things to happen. In Europe, it's been different. And the point here is that people have used the USITS wrapper, which is, you know, I, I suspect most of you know, um, you know, the pride and joy of the EU's investment asset management decision in terms of a EU investment product that's kind of conquered the world. And the original point about the USITS wrapper was it was meant to be a retail investment product that was liquid. It invested in transferable securities. You could get in and out there at NAV. Uh, and the way that people have structured um, ETFs in Europe um, particularly has been to use uh, the usage wrapper, not necessarily exclusively, but, but by and large pretty much everything. Uh, but unlike usits that aren't generally traded on an exchange, you end up with these ETFs being exchange traded, so you get intraday liquidity rather than having to wait till the end of the day or whenever. And the other point is you've got market makers in there who are making a market in the things rather than necessarily trying to rely on a redemption of the underlying securities. And, and as we've talked about, sometimes they don't even have the underlying securities. So in a way, speaking from a British perspective, you're looking at a vehicle that sort of was last in fashion about 100 years ago, which is the idea of a British listed investment trust, which is a kind of corporate that's listed on the stock exchange, and you have people buying and selling the units in those things during the day. The great advantage of the ETF is these investment trusts can be pretty illiquid. They don't necessarily sell at net asset value. The beauty for these guys of an ETF is you hope you're going to get to NAV. So then... Uh, the regulators have said, what kind of goes wrong? One of the things...
been worried about, just to knock this on the head, is they sort of get worried when people say how fantastic ETFs are and how they're taking over the whole market because they suddenly think if you've got loads of people investing in sort of essentially index tracking products or products that are sort of are replicating particular things, what if there's a market crash? What's the systemic risk uh, caused by these products? And that's where you get back to the CDO example because people say, you know, regulators say, if you look at the structure of these things, they're massively complicated. And regulators say, do people really know what they're buying? It's easy to say, I am trading in this and there's a price and I'm just buying and selling this unit. But if you get into a stressed environment, what's really behind it? Then you get into the questions that um, Aldo in particular talked about, which is, Regulators can understand the sort of physically settled stuff. If you've got an ETF that actually invests in the underlying index and you know, has a basket of stocks underneath it, which is pretty much the same thing, then if you've got to wind the thing up or if you've got to sell it, yeah, it'll cost money, but you know, they can kind of see where it's going to come from. Uh, the trouble with that is, as Aldo said, that costs a lot of money. So you want to look at something more synthetic or you want to have an ETF that actually works its assets, sweats its assets to sort of minimise the dealing costs for people. So then the regulators have looked at the whole sort of idea of synthetic ETFs um, and also, you know, depending on where you are, things that are sort of collateralised. And what they've been concerned about there is that investors actually understand that if you're in a synthetic product, you're not really collateralised against, you know, the index that you're investing in. For instance, you could be in a FTSE 100 mm -hmm. ETF but actually there could be no FTSE 100 stocks anywhere near it. Uh, they've been concerned about a few things there. It's largely around disclosure though, but it's also around the quality of collateral. And one of the other sort of great themes that comes in is it's been an attempt to bash banks or at least financial institutions because one of the things they've seen with ETFs and all this kind of stuff is um, in, in, in some of the sort of more synthetic uh, collateralized structure, and Aldo, you may have a view on this, Joe, too, they found when they sort of opened the HUD and looked underneath that actually, you know, ETF A could have a total return swap with Bank B, and Bank B might have provided some collateral, but the collateral that Bank B provides has got absolutely nothing to do with the reference point of the ETF. You know, it's not FTSE 100 stocks, it's, you know, outer Mongolian mining stocks or something like that. And so the regulators say, oh, well, is this really a way for the banks to get cheap finance by essentially giving collateral against an instrument that's selling, you know, set, 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 set some, something on an option? Um, the only real way that they can deal with this has been through the USITS framework. And so where the regulators got, where ESMA has got through a series of guidances, they have tried to make sure that you know, they are implementing specific rules, at least in the European context, on the use of collateral uh, and, and what's acceptable and what isn't, and sort of stress testing situations. Uh, the other thing that they focus on, Vincent has mentioned very heavily, is, is disclosure and actually making sure uh, that the products do properly describe what they are. I think one thing, though, that... Um, Joe, in particular, has, has, has made a point which, which is perhaps missing a bit from the sort of regulatory approaches. Because in Europe we've looked at these as USITS products and the regulator really sees USITS as a retail product, uh, they have approached a lot of these issues from a retail investor state of mind. Now, we do see ETFs marketed in large part to retail investors, but when you look at the more esoteric products, actually there are far more sophisticated people investing in them. And in fact, if Joe, if I can say it this way, you're essentially intermediating and you know what you're doing and you're, you're, you're doing this for your underlying client. So I think what we found is there is, you know, we, we found from a regulatory perspective, something of a fear that this is a monster that is about to sort of be unleashed and collapse the whole of the financial markets in a similar way to the securitization crisis. Uh, two, I think there is a fear about the extent to which it could tarnish the USITS brand in terms of being sold to in, uh, retail investors if anything went wrong. But three, I think the real fundamental tension is the extent to which we have a regulatory regime which hasn't, to take Joe's point in a more positive light, which hasn't yet really properly caught up with uh, the way that asset management is going and the way that you know, a, a far more sort of sophisticated 21st century approach to asset allocation. Now, let me take the other side of that debate, if I will, um, create a little bit of a rutkus here. Um, first of all, I agree with what you and Aldo, um, what you and Aldo just said about ETNs. Uh, clearly, ETNs are credit instruments. Uh, there definitely is significant credit risk when you invest in an ETN, clearly. 
and a lot of investors who invest in ETNs need to understand that. Uh, by the way, you need to understand what an ETN is. An ETN is an unsecured credit instrument. So if I'm bank XYZ and I start up an ETN on the S&P 500, you give me 10 million and I can take that 10 million and go throw a party with it. Uh, no one says I've got to invest that 10 million anyway. All it says, all the agreement says is that I've got to give you your 10 million back in 10 years time or whatever. Uh, but what we have to put in perspective is that ETNs leveraged uh, and inverse ETFs make up three to four percent of the entire ETF universe anyhow, okay? Remember, ETFs, generally speaking, particularly physical replication ETFs are actually holding the actual assets, okay? Those assets are custodied with a custodian. Now, if you go back the last 13 years, anyone who's been in financial business will tell you that it has been, in many instances, a very turbulent 13 years. We had the uh, meltdown, the um, uh, software meltdown of 2000, 2003, and then of course we had the 2007 credit crisis. And guess what? You know, within those 13 years, yeah, there were three ETNs which failed, uh, and they were Lehman Brothers ETNs, but to my knowledge, there weren't any ETFs, there certainly weren't any physical replication ETFs, and there weren't any synthetic replication ETFs which went bust. So. Um, I agree with regulators most of the time. Uh, we just have to be careful not to overregulate because remember, okay, that the ETF market here in your land is roughly a $350 billion market, but in the US, it's a $1.3 trillion market. And if people find trading ETFs here in your land cumbersome, or if they find that there's too much regulation, they'll just trade the ETFs in the US, and the ETFs in the US are much more liquid, they're much deeper, and by the way, all of that, pretty much all of the hedge funds focus on, not, not all the time, but they do focus quite significantly on US ETFs because um, the markets are less fragmented, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think having this debate is, is good and healthy, but I think it's also important that the regulators do not over-exaggerate um, the risks within ETFs because in many, many respects, particularly the use of ETFs, uh, remember here in your land we have MIFID also, and then a lot of these ETFs trade on exchanges, so you have exchange regulation. I think they're very, very well regulated here uh, in the US. But having said that, uh, Aldo said something very interesting about security lending. That's a real issue. And Jonathan, you said something about the quality of that collateral. That's an issue. But there is, uh, you know, let me say this. An ETF is not a CMO. Uh, I really don't think so. God forbid we ever get to that point, but uh, I, don't, I, I just don't see that.